recorded this evening. So um, again, it'll it'll take a few minutes for people to come in. We had uh, 49 registrations uh, for today, which was uh, exciting for us. And um, we're really glad that you are, that you're here with us. Maybe if you want to in the chat, if you could maybe write um, uh, what city you're joining uh, uh, from here. So I'm uh, Nolan Sharp, I'm in Zagreb. Um, and I work with uh, Udrga Focus. And here in Zagreb, where uh, uh, Anita is my colleague uh, in Focus. And we also, um, this event is co-sponsored by Udrga Partner. Uh, Udrga Partner uh, hosts uh, the Global Leadership Summit. And so I know a lot of you are on our email list um, for, uh, for Partner. Um, and uh, I'll wait just a minute to, 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 to introduce our guests this evening uh, as more people connect. Um, but uh, it's really um, great to see you coming out. Uh, the, the weather, let's see, it has been not so nice here in Zagreb today. Ron, Steve, Blossom, how, how is the weather where you guys are? It's beautiful it here. Is. Yeah, it's uh, going to be 72 degrees. Oh, okay. Here. Wow, it's nice in, in Celsius. Yes, in Celsius. it's That's beautiful. Like, uh, yeah, 23. Blossom, where are you physically? Uh, Atlanta, in Atlanta, Georgia. And, uh, mm -hmm. and Ron, you're in, you're in Tennessee right now, is yeah. that right? If you like sunny and 68 with a light breeze, it's perfect. Oh, there you go. That's that's sixty eight. It's about eight nineteen or so, I think. And Steve, where where are you? Cincinnati. Cincinnati. And it's sixty degrees here. Cincinnati's American football team finally beat my football team by a huge margin this past weekend, and the first time in a very very long time. So that was painful. And, and go UC Bearcats. I don't know if you uh, noticed. Yeah. <laughs> They're having a banner year. Yeah. So. We have um, uh, a friend of ours, Dragica, has joined us from Slovenia. That's that's exciting. We have people from Mirovitica, Varaždin, Varaždin, uh, how, however, <laughs> people like to say it. Um, uh, yeah, Dragica is in Maribor. Uh, Maribor is the home of a of a soccer club that uh, is in Maribor, right? That that won an absolutely shocking victory. They beat Tottenham Hotspur. Is it Maribor? No, or is it? No, 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 no it's more uh, Mora, Mora, yeah, yeah, from even a smaller town in Slovenia, beat the mighty Tottenham, uh, Tottenham Hotspur a week or two ago, and one of the great shocks of soccer in recent in recent years. Sweet so people joining from Sisak, Um So that's that's great to have you with us. Well, it's uh, it's uh, six oh four, so I think we should we can go ahead and get started with introductions. Um, so I, like I said, I'm Nolan Sharp. I live here in Zagreb. I'm a part of Udruga Focus and our co-host uh, organization Udruga Partner today. Um, but uh, and we are very happy to partner with uh, global leadership partners from that started uh, through Steve Simpson, who's with us this evening, and another man. Um, Todd Geist, who are uh, former Procter & Gamble employees that uh, decided to do something really uh, useful and significant maybe with their, with, uh, with their golden years um, and, uh, and something that kind of just started with volunteering in Bulgaria has now spread out. How many countries are you guys in now, Steve? 37. 37 countries where, and how many total people are now involved as speakers for Global Leadership Partners? 75. 75. So, so uh, uh, without, when COVID wasn't happening, uh, Ron uh, and Steve, Ron and Steve were actually in Croatia as everything shut down. So uh, March uh, 2020, um, uh, with all of that craziness, when you remember when Italy shut down, uh, they were actually with us and we were doing an event and then got canceled. Another one got canceled in the middle of uh, getting ready. So uh, Ron and Steve will always remember Croatia in the context of the beginning of COVID, I think. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, the Ron and Steve and Blossom are, are volunteers who, who've decided to use their business experience to help uh, people from really all, now all over the world. Um, and uh, we're really, really glad to have you with us today. So uh um at the end uh please please uh stay with us to the end at the end i will speak about how the opportunity will work to um 
to sign up for the possibility to meet um, with Ron or Steve or Blossom in a smaller mentoring um, uh, appointment that would last around 75 minutes. That's free of charge. Just need to negotiate and figure out and get the time slots correct. Um, so you can stay with us to the, to the end and I'll be able to explain how all that works. But without... Um, uh, uh, Oh, one more thing I'd say is that we in in, um, in our work here in Zagreb, one of the things we have is a business club that meets um, about every two weeks. Uh, it is hosted by Christian uh, Tinotti, who is the leader of Mazar's uh, Tinotti uh, Consulting and um, uh, Accounting in Zagreb. And so it's a it's a group of business people who who get together and talk about themes related to business, uh, faith, and the Bible. And uh, our next meeting is on Monday. So if, if that interests you, uh, you can uh, you all have, you all received emails from me. You can uh, send me an email back about that, and I can uh, let you know how how that works. It, it's in Zagreb, but it also has a Zoom online component, so you can attend uh, in person or join us uh, uh, over Zoom. So that's a, a little bit about us and. Uh, Without saying any more, then Ron, thank you for again for being. Ron is going to be our sort of main um, uh, person uh, sharing with us this evening. So, go ahead, Ron. Oh, thank you. It's uh, an honor to be able to speak to uh, my friends in Croatia. Um, been there a few times. Loved my uh, time in Croatia, visiting people, getting to know people uh, on a more personal level, and speaking and touring and. Uh, like uh, Nolan said, I was never been there with Steve, been there with Todd. Um, just just love the, the the country, and, and I can't wait to come back. Um, but right now, <laughs> it's it's just not going to work out. <laughs> Hopefully soon. Uh, we're going to speak today on cohesive leadership teams, and, and this is very personal for me because I've spent my entire career on leadership teams in, in even multiple countries and cities and states. And, and every time it's a challenge to, to pull a team together to be cohesive and really function properly. And there's some, uh, Patrick Liziotti wrote a book called The Advantage. He's written several books on, on teams and team development. He's a consultant and he works primarily with very, very large uh, multi-billion dollar companies and helping build their leadership teams. And, 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 and I've used several of his tools uh, throughout my career, had those tools used um, um, with the teams, with the consultants that are helping us uh, become better teams. So I'm a bit passionate about the subject. So I, I loved it to talk on it. And now I'm as a consultant teaching a bit and using some of these tools myself, uh, personally in middle Tennessee. Um, so that's the introduction. And let me jump in and talk about my family a bit because this is something I'm really proud of. Each of us are gonna introduce uh, our families. This is my family, uh, my wife, Karen of 35 years. And we have uh, three daughters in this picture and they all have uh, uh, babies. So we all have grandchildren by each daughter, uh, five grandchildren in total. And um, this little guy standing right in front of me, Jonah Howe, he's nine. Uh, uh, we met him when we were on assignment with Ford in the country of China, fell in love with him. He didn't have a family, so uh, we brought him home. So um, I'm retired. Um, from the Ford Motor Company after 30 years, but I have a little guy that I'm raising um, and just loving the, the fact of having him around. And um, that said, from a, from a career perspective, I started with Ford Motor Company uh, 30, uh, when I was 23 years old, right out of university and um, worked as an engineer and then was very fortunate um, to be able, and I was very passionate about leadership and leadership development. And um, they gave me lots of opportunities to, to move up and around in the company and uh, worked in, in several different uh, factories and organizations within the company. And, and, and ultimately my, my career uh, uh, culminated in, in an assignment in the country of China uh, to go there and build factories um, and, and literally from the ground up, starting with, you know, concrete and, and girders and, and all the things that required to build a factory. And then, and of course, uh, hire the people. So, um, and, and, and it ended my career with Ford as an uh, executive director of, of powertrain, meaning I'm responsible to, to build uh, automatic transmissions and engines uh, for, and mostly for the country of China, but throughout Asia. And it was just a wonderful career. Um, 
and a lot of experience uh, around leadership. And I've always been a student of leadership and what that means and how it can uh, help a company be successful. Now I'll pass it over to, I think, Steve to introduce himself. Okay. <clears throat> My name is Steve Simpson and I live in Cincinnati, Ohio. This is my backyard and this is my family. I have a, a wife of 46 years. I have three married children. I have 15 grandchildren and the little baby in the corner is my first great grandchild. And uh, fortunately, my mother is still alive. She's 95. So we currently have a five generations uh, family. And uh, we just got the five generation pictures taken. Uh, I am an engineer by background. I spent my career at Procter & Gamble starting right out of the university. I spent 33 years with P&G. I lived in three different states and I lived in Japan. And uh, I've traveled the world, uh, as Ron has also with Procter & Gamble, having been in all 50 states and 50 countries. <clears throat> so, uh, and since I've retired, I've been consulting, volunteering, coaching, mentoring, uh, many different hats. It's good to be with you today. Okay, so... I am Blossom Martindale, and um, unlike these gentlemen, I uh, actually have a very small family group, and these are my three kids, and the two babies are my shining stars. Those are my grandkids, uh, and I have lived in, I guess, lived in one country, but I am from the beautiful uh, island of St. Lucia, and I moved here many moons ago. And uh, I currently live in Smyrna, Georgia, in the US. And I am still doing coaching, training, recruiting. Uh, it's been about 30 years now. And I worked with a Fortune 40 company uh, for 26 years uh, of that time that I've been doing that and worked in many, many capacities. What I've appreciated about um, working with uh, the, you know, my, my prior company is that it allowed me to travel the world and also be able to bring my kids and show them the world as well. And um, so I have been to Croatia a couple of times, have not lived there, but I've been to Croatia, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place uh, and um, hope to visit it again soon. Uh, but uh, for the time that I have um, with many of the mentees and uh, people that I coach, I absolutely love what I do in terms of coaching and consulting for small business owners. And uh, it really brings me a lot of joy. And since I've been with GLP, I've been able to really serve in that capacity. And I'm just really looking forward to more of these sessions as well. And hopefully today you guys can hopefully take away something from our discussion today that will be able to help you in your own businesses. Great. That's great. Maybe I'll jump in there for just for a second uh, and uh, go back here. I, I had done a quick survey with people before we, um, when they registered. So you might be interested to see the results uh, uh, as we go through. So the, this, uh, you're seeing a slide that says, uh, how would you rate the effectiveness or no, the, the cohesiveness or the connectedness of your team from one to five? And so a couple of people uh, gave a, a best answer. A few people gave, you know, the lowest answers and the majority of the results were sort of, you know, three or four sort of average or above average. So um, I thought that was interesting. And when I asked, uh, what burning questions are you struggling with? I can't, couldn't put all the answers in, but the kind of areas that people answered about what they are, they're really struggling with about teams are things like boundaries, lack of responsibility, how to build trust, resolve conflict, priorities, ego, how to be, uh, to what extent to be vulnerable as a leader of a team, how to build unity after a merger between companies constructive conflict, dividing responsibilities, maintaining motivation, and maintaining connection. So I just thought I'd throw that out for everybody to kind of see um, 
Ron, you gotta, you gotta address all that. Got it. <laughs> love it, love it. Okay. All right. So, so let's let's get started. I, I want to start off with just a personal story about the most dysfunctional team I've ever worked on and, and with. And 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 I'm going to give you a little bit of a background because it, um, it it adds to the the story to understand where where I was at at, at the time. Um, I'd been raised in Cincinnati, Ohio, Southern Ohio, went to college in Ohio, moved back to Cincinnati, Ohio, and, and worked at Ford Motor Company for um, about six years, seven years, I think. Um, <clears throat> and I was asked to move to Michigan, which is a big deal because it's, you know, it's, it's a five hour drive north. It's not too far from home, but it's a big it was a big deal for me because I was leaving my hometown first time in my life. Um, so, 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 and, and asked to, to work in a, in another location. It was a large factory. In fact, it was the, the largest manufacturing uh, facility in Ford Motor Co manufacturing facility in Ford Motor Company at the time at um, I think about 280,000 square meters. So a uh, very large facility on several hundred acres. Of property and it was a very important facility so so it was a promotion so I you know I really want to go do this and be a, a senior manager in the company so I talked my family into moving and um, so we leave town so my wife and three young children at the time moved to, to Michigan where we know no one uh, my wife quits her job and decides to be a permanent full-time mom which was a great idea um, but because she didn't want anyone else to look after our children but her we moved out of town um, so we so we moved to Michigan and we had the pressures of selling a house buying a house finding a church for our family and and new schools so all this is kind of going on but but I show up uh, to this factory this large factory and um and it's pretty significant for the company, very, very high pressure environment um, for, for this reason. We were providing automatic transmissions for the truck business, which in the motor company is extremely important. 90% of the profit of the entire company is the Ford F-150. And we were providing all of their automatic transmissions for that one product line. And the line speed, and this is a bit boring if you're not in manufacturing, but the line speed to make an automatic transmission was every 12 seconds it produced an automatic transmission. And if you think about an automatic transmission being the most complicated part of a vehicle to make one every 12 seconds is tremendous. Most companies, the best they can do is every 30 seconds. This is every 12. So it's very, very high pressure, high line speed, very fast paced environment. And to describe the team a bit, so the, um, here's what it looked like. We have a, a finance manager. We always have to have a finance manager. Three operations departments, because the, the, just because there were so many people that worked there. Uh, a new product launch department. Of course, you have to have an HR leader and a quality leader. And then the engineering leader, which, which was me. So that's what my team looked like. Um, but there was a, a bit a, another element to this story that I didn't expect is the culture in Michigan is different than the culture in Southern Ohio. It's like a Northern culture. Very People are very short, quick, um, honestly, not very friendly. Whereas a Southern culture, uh, people tend to talk a bit, share where they're at, what they're doing, and just, just get to know each other. Um, so, so it was a different culture also. So now the team. So this team I'll call it dysfunctional. In fact, I think Patrick Lencioni wrote one of his books called The Five Dif Dysfunctions of the Team, of a team, and we had all those dysfunctions and we did them really, really well. Um, the team was very results driven, um, always about the numbers, holding people accountable. Um, that was about it. Very, very driven by results. Everything was about the numbers. Uh, there was very little teamwork. Uh, each department that I discussed earlier uh, acted independently. So I would call it more of a, um, 
as an analogy, a golf team. So we, we were all on a, on a golf team where we'd all go out and play our own game and we'd add our scores up at the end. But what we really needed was a basketball team. Because we worked together, we passed, we set up shots, we, we blocked, we worked together to do a team score. But this is not how this dysfunctional team operated. Every department was independent, kind of out for themselves. The leadership was very militant. In other words, this is what you're going to do. This is how you're going to do it. This is when you're going to do it. And everybody go, go, go. So it wasn't a lot of discussion about what we were doing or why we were doing it. It was more about getting things done quickly, very top down. Additionally, the whole organization operated in a crisis mode, long hours, expedited shipments to the customers. The results were just terrible. They missed schedule, missed shipments. They were over budget by $10 million. Quality was unacceptable. So I leave Ohio, which I had a really good job on a really good team. And I lived near my family and everything was nice to go work in this mess. And I thought to myself, I really made a mistake. Well, then there came a day, I'll call it the day of new direction. Um, things were so bad in this, this team. And, and the sad thing about it, it was just a very, very important product for the company so that the company couldn't tolerate this. And when you work in a big corporation, you'll either perform or you will no longer be part of the company. Uh, so it was getting a little bit scary. Um, and I thought, I'm, I think I really screwed up by moving, taking this promotion. One day uh, we get called to an offsite with the entire leadership team um, is asked to go to Dearborn, Michigan to a, to a big conference room or a small conference room, maybe, um, and, 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 and pull together and have a conversation with the executive director of Worldwide Powertrain, a guy that we would rarely ever talk to, but he wants to meet with us as a, as a small group team. So we go. So he tells us to go to the whiteboard. We meet this guy, his name is Mike. Mike says, everybody go to the board and write down the results of your team on a different whiteboard. So we all did that. And you know what? The results of each individual team or department in that organization wasn't bad. Then he asked the plant manager to go and write down the results of the plant, the entire organization. How is the organization doing? And it was terrible. I had to talk about our performance to schedule, which we missed. The quality, which was lower than expected. And we talked about our, our performance to budget, which we were missing terribly. And he looked around and he said, there's no team members in this room. There's a bunch of cowboys running departments. So I don't need you. And he fired us. He said, he walked out of the room. He said, you're no longer employed. Well, uh, it was a bit nerve wracking for me for those few moments. Um, then he comes back into the room and let us sit for five to 10 minutes to think about this with a consultant, a team building consultant. And he said, I'm gonna give you guys a second chance. You're gonna work with this fellow he's gonna take you through a program to help you build a cohesive team. And you're all gonna work with him. And every month you're gonna come back to me and we're gonna report on how you're doing as a team. That's so all we're gonna talk about is team behaviors and what teams look like and act like. And so our journey to become a cohesive team began that day and Mike got our attention. Now, ultimately, I'll tell you the short answer to the story because I'm going to walk through the steps in a few minutes. Um, the team grew. In about nine months, the results of that business were phenomenal. We grew as a team. We worked together. We focused on the right things. We took care of each other. Uh, we became friends. And we worked as a cohesive team. We made budget. We made schedule. Quality improved tenfold. And we became the model factory for the company. 
Now, how did that happen? The story, when I think about it, I say, how could this possibly be? We didn't add a system. We didn't add a process. We didn't add special controls. We didn't learn any new technology. All we did was figure out how to work as a team. And we use a very simple formula that uh, called the five behaviors of a cohesive team that I'll give all the credit to Patrick Lencioni. Um, this is uh, something he does. He, he teaches in his book called The Advantage. And recently, and this book is only, in fact, the story I'm telling you um, was from year 2000. Uh, his book that I'm going to talk about is written in 2012. However, he's been writing books for a long time, and I think this is more of an accumulation of, of what he's learned over time as a consultant. So the question I want to answer is, why is it important to have a cohesive team? Well, as Pat says, it's a cohesive team is your competitive advantage. If you're really going to win in a competitive world of business, you have to function as a team. Secondly, the very best results producing organizations are always supported by a cohesive team. Thirdly, almost invariably, the real reason companies fail today can be traced back to not embracing one of these behaviors that I'm about to talk about. And lastly, and most important for me and what I learned about working on a cohesive team, boy, it's just a lot more fun. When you really enjoy spending time with the people that you're with 10, 12 hours a day, because um, you're working together and you're supporting each other correctly, it's a, it's a lot better place to be. So as a, that's my introduction to, to the, uh, the five uh, behaviors that, that Pat talks about in his book and, in, and actually a couple different books that he's written. The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, he wrote, um, I think in 2000, possibly. Um, so the first one is building trust. And so I think we'll click the slide and I'll show you the five dysfunctions that we're, we're talking about here. Here we go, building trust. Um, so this is a different kind of trust. There's a, there's a bit of trust where I know people really well, so I trust or I know what they're going to do or what, how they're going to act. But what Pat teaches is a vulnerability-based trust where, where members are completely comfortable with transparency, meaning that they may not have all the answers, but they abandon fear and pride and egos that we see oftentimes in big companies for the greater good of the team. Um, the foundation of trust is always where you have to start because without trust, you, there's just no chance for the team to build. And, and, and for me, I had to learn this vulnerability-based trust idea uh, because I'm pretty a hard driving person myself and I don't always slow down to listen. It's kind of my personality, just go, 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 go. Um, but, but when you reach a point on a team where it's vulnerability-based trust, people will admit their faults and weaknesses. Uh, team members will say they're wrong when they're wrong. They'll admit mistakes. They'll, they'll ask for help and they'll understand and be okay with asking other people that can do things better than them. Now, how does a team build trust? What we did in this particular story, there was two significant elements that, that are tools that we used and the consultant used, and, and Pat Lencioni talks about this a lot in, his, in a couple of his books, was one was um, personality profiling. And in GLP, we teach that as our, in one of our emotional, emotional intelligence series or the uh, of, of personality profiling, what it can do for your company, what it can do for your people. And what we did is we went through this program where we learned and took tests to understand our, our profiles and our personalities, how we're naturally wired. And then we shared those results with the rest of the people on the team. And the idea is I could understand how my colleagues are naturally wired. They could understand how I'm naturally wired. And we could talk about that. 
what do we do well and what do we need help with just just because of who we are from a personality perspective and, and i remember um one particular individual the quality manager him and i could not get along which was odd for me because i i usually can get along with everybody but he was so into detail it was crazy um more detail than anyone would ever need but as i understand his personality profile that's just how he was wired. He's a perfectionist. Things had to be exactly so. He had to have all the information to make a decision. I'm very different. I need about 80% of the information and I need to go fast. I do like perfection, but it's not required. What's required is we reach the goal. This guy and I worked things out based on our conversations of how we were naturally wired at birth, if you will, from personality profiling became great friends and we started golfing together on the weekends and um and and got along really well at work i saw that relationship change amongst many of our members of our team as they got to know each other and and, and this particular consultant with us use other tools like share a story about your biggest challenges in high school or what were you like in high school and we bit it we did a bit of touchy feely conversations uh, for just the purpose of getting to know each other but ultimately, what we found out and understood is if we share a little bit about ourselves personally, and we listen carefully about other people personally, we, and we learn that skill of listening well and understanding who people are, you'll become a vulnerability-based, trust-based organization. Now, this only works if the leader goes first. The leader of the organization must model this behavior must model his weaknesses, talk about his weaknesses and share what he needs help with. Um, because if he doesn't, if he models, he has all the answers and he's driving forward, everybody else is gonna act the same way. So that was a bit, a bit of our first step in, in my discussion around building trust. And um, Nolan, is there any questions we want that popped up under building trust or should we just keep going? No, but uh, yeah, I, sh I should have said that. Please, if you have a, a comment or a question, you can write in creation or in English as we're going along. We'll have a, a, a time at the end where we can all kind of discuss more broadly, but please, if there's something that, that uh, as, as we go along, um, please feel free to, to write in the chat and um, uh, let us know something that's on your mind. Good, okay. You know, you know, Ron, um, as you were speaking, you know, one of the things that um, just kind of clicked with me was that, you know, as you talk about cohesive teams, it's almost like having an entire book, right? Because mm -hmm. if you have one part of the book, maybe one or two chapters, well, you don't know what the middle is like and you don't know what the end is like. So it's kind of bringing all the pieces together. And now you have a whole book that you can really enjoy. So that just kind of clicked in my head as you were talking about the cohesiveness piece. And the building trust is really the first chapter, right? As you will in the book. Absolutely. Yeah. If you miss that chapter, the rest of the book doesn't make sense, does it? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. I like that. I like that, that idea. Thank you for that, Blossom. Um, so, so, so the next one is mastering conflict. And this is very, very important. Um, and and not, not a personal conflict, but but ideological conflict. This is the willingness to disagree oftentimes and, and can be passionately around issues or decisions that must be made. Um, this must happen in order to make better decisions is, is, is be, be willing to have some level of conflict when you're making decisions. Um, but if you don't have trust, the conflict could, could go in the wrong direction. Um, and the reason conflict is important in a group is it, 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 it's really the, the beginning of the pursuit of truth. If we really want to understand the truth of what we need to do, why we need to do it, and why does it make sense, we have to talk about it. And we have to get everyone's opinion. And, and, and it's not a, a conflict as in, in a negative conflict. It's more of a constructive conflict. And what, what Pat details in, in his book, which, which I like and didn't have this available to me at the time is he, he details a continuum, uh, the conflict continuum, where, where some companies just love to stay to the far left 
where, where there's an artificial harmony where everybody gets along and we just agree and it just all feels good, but we really don't get to the root of what we need to do and why we need to do it. The other side of the continuum is the mean-spirited uh, personal attacks type of thing where, where it's destructive. What, what, what Pat talks about, you need to be someplace in the middle where there's a bit of tension but we don't go from constructive to destructive. He calls it the ideal conflict point. And, and I kind of, I like that, um, but it's a bit risky because we could, we could have a bit of conflict and things could go over that point to the destructive side. However, if the team really has built trust and it's the kind of trust where they, where they, they care and understand who people are and, and, and how they naturally act and behave and, 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 and you've built a strong team, um, you can actually step over into the destructive side, get through that and, and come back. Um, I call this encouraging healthy tension amongst your leadership. Um, so, so how do you do that? And, and what Pat talked about, and, and I've seen this many, many times, is mining for conflict in meetings. So, so what that means is if you're the leader of a team, you pay attention to what's not being said, or maybe who's not talking, and kind of kind of force the issue of, hey, what do you think about this? Do you agree? Do you not agree? And kind of kind of demand members to voice their concerns. Now it gets to the point where someone says, hey, I absolutely disagree with this direction. I'm not going to support it. Um, here's your opportunity to ask why, but it's also the opportunity to confirm them for bringing up their disagreement. For example, Joe says, hey, I absolutely disagree with this direction. As a leader, I'd say, Joe, I love the fact that you disagree with this direction. And I really wanna understand what's going on and why it's a bad direction. You wanna confirm the people during the conflict that it's okay. It'll actually lower tension a bit because now they're doing what they're supposed to do. They're, they're talking about the issues, they're working through them, they're disagreeing, and, um, and the leader is saying, hey, it's okay. It's really okay to disagree. What I have seen, I have not actually done this, but I've seen this in a couple companies where they'll develop a rules of engagement statement for conflict in meetings. This is how we do it. It's okay. Um, this is what you can say. This is what you can't say. And they kind of build a little charter. Um, but that does a couple of things. One, it helps manage the conflict during the meeting but it also says we expect it. Because if we're gonna take the time to write a charter, that this is how we're gonna to have a, a tension in our meetings, then it's gonna be okay. Um, the idea is to establish a conflict culture that everyone appreciates. Um, and, and, and I mentioned earlier that I'd worked in Asia. It's very different in Asia. So one thing you have to think about is the culture of the company you're in, the, the culture of the country you're in. And for me, moving to Michigan, a different culture, I had to think about that culture versus a Southern culture. Uh, this all kind of weighs into it, but, but we need to give ourselves permission to have healthy conflict and expect it and be able to manage it. Um, okay, so let's talk about achieving commitment. The reason conflict is so important is that a team cannot achieve commitment without it. People will not actively commit to a decision. They have not had the opportunity to have input, to provide their input. But Pat says if people don't weigh in, they can't buy in. Um, now, I wanna bring up a, a, a port, an important um, distinction here. It's not consensus, but it's commitment. I think what can happen if companies are too worried about consensus, they'll spend too much time talking about it and never make a decision. The leader needs to step in at some point and say, this is the direction we're gonna go, but only after everyone is weighed in. Um, I've seen the consensus style leadership and it absolutely allows you to miss opportunities and make decisions late 
and we talk things, talk about things forever, and we just never get going at the pace we need to go. So it's very different than commitment. Commitment is this: we're going to talk about it. We're going to we're going to try to um, move forward, but we're all going to going to listen to each other and understand. And one thing that that we were able to use in this team that I'm I'm talking about is when we would have conflict and we would discuss and everybody would weigh in to where they were at and we never would reach consensus. This is a tool that we would use. The, the leader would say, if you 100% agree, give me a thumbs up. And we go around the room and people that were 100% bought in, we give them a thumbs up. If you understand, you feel like you've been heard, you don't agree, but you can 100% support, give me a thumb sideways. And people would give a thumb sideways. Then he would say, if you absolutely can't support, give me a thumbs down. And if we got a thumbs down, we'd talk some more. And we'd let that person at least um, bring forward their, their objections to the direction. Um, again, it wasn't consensus, but we would, we would make sure everybody was heard. And I think that visual of being able to show your thumb of, of whether you're gonna be commitment or not, um, really did, did something for the psychology of the people when they left the room. Because if I do give you a thumb sideways or a thumbs up, um, I'm gonna support do what I said I was gonna do. All right, embracing accountability is the fourth. Um, I thought I'd maybe comment on that real quickly. I, one of my favorite things that Patrick Lencioni uh, talked about, maybe it's in Death by Meeting, is um, he compares meetings to movies. And he says like a good movie is about two hours long. So a good meeting should probably be about two hours long. And that a good movie has a, um, you, you get into the story because you enjoy it, right? But then it reveals the conflict. So it's not, there's no conflict and it's not only conflict, but the conflict kind of comes out, but it builds and builds and builds to some sort of resolution. And then it's really emotionally satisfying. Like a good movie, two hours long, there's some emotional satisfaction, but the conflict comes out and it's dealt with. And then, and then the tension you know, goes down. And uh, I've always thought that all kind of stuck with me. It's a really good analogy that, that a good meeting should feel kind of like a good movie. Like, and, and two hours is probably about as long as it can go before it starts to feel like a movie that got too long as well. Um, so I, I like that, that analogy. Uh, Blossom or, or Steve, do you guys want to add anything to that? Yeah, that's a great analogy because, you know, no one wants to watch a movie that's boring, right? Going into a meeting, oh my gosh, for an hour or two, and it just goes on and on and nobody's really talking. Yeah. So the, the movie analogy is awesome because when you go to the movies, you don't just want to sit there and just watch. You want to be able to react. You want to be able to maybe whisper something to your friend. You want to get into it. And a lot of times you're trying to figure out, you know, well, what is the tension, right? What is going on? What's the conflict? And so, um, you know, at the end of it, you want to feel all these emotions, and I think that's what spurs people on to be able to kind of go into committing and embracing accountability. Yeah. Outstanding. Yeah, I'll have to say what, when the meetings um, get a little bit exciting, we, we called it passion for manufacturing. <laughs> we, we named it, right? That made it okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but, but. Actually, give you a little something to talk about when you got home at night, too. Hey, man, you should have seen John today. Wow. <laughs> he, he didn't agree. He didn't agree at first. But we got through it. And it was it was interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I, li I like that analogy to the meetings. It's good. Thank you. Yeah. OK, embracing accountability. So the statement is, it is critical that team members are held accountable to it implement the agreed upon decisions and goals. And, and what Pat talks about, I like a lot is, is peer to peer accountability um, or peer pressure. Now, now it's not to say that it lets the boss off the hook. I mean, ultimately, I mean, if you ask the question is holding people accountable, the senior leader's responsibility or the team's responsibility, the answer is yes, on a functional cohesive team. Uh, the, the, the senior leaders need to model, I'm going to hold people accountable, uh, because if he doesn't or she doesn't, no one else will. So it's a, it's a bit of both. 
But the idea is creating this environment where everybody embraces accountability. Um, there's a key point here. When team members know that their colleagues are truly committed to something, um, they will feel comfortable confronting them about the issues without fearing defensiveness or backlash. After all, they're merely getting back on track or seeking clarity when another team member's off track or not doing the right things. So it, it can become this normal, I expect my peers, uh, if I'm not on track or doing things like we agreed, to step in and say, hey, hey, Ron, what's what's up with that? We said this, but this is where you're at. What, how can I help? Um, that's a nice place to be. And ultimately, that's where you want to be. Um, when you get to that point where the leader is comfortable with stepping in and saying, hey, look, um, I need you to, to change because this is what we said. But then when he's not around, everybody on the team is willing to step in and, and say, yeah, I'm, I, what's going on? How can I help? Um, that didn't go well. Um, what do you think? Uh, it's not, it's, it's just one of those environments where it's more of a team sport. And uh, this is what he's trying to talk about here. Um, but there's another distinction. There's behavioral accountability and there's quantitative accountability. Most leaders and teams are very comfortable about looking at the quantitative results, like the numbers aren't, aren't there this week. We didn't make this, we didn't make that. And it's all just, it's kind of this cold number game. And we need that a bit. We need to understand the numbers because we do have to produce results. But it's really special when we can talk about behavioral accountability. We say we're gonna go do things and support systems and processes, or we say we're gonna treat each other a certain way, um, based on core values, based on what we've decided, decided how we're going to, to live and work together. Those behavioral accountabilities are very, very important. Because if we do that well, then, then we can do the, the hard facts and numbers well also. Now, before I go to focusing on results, Blossom, do you have some comments on embracing accountability? Yeah, you know, and I think this is where I probably have a little bit of a different perspective on accountability and embracing account accountability. Um, yet I see it more as um, uh, self accountability is really, really important and making sure that you partner with someone for accountability. Is when you think about holding someone accountable, it's almost like putting a gun to someone's head, right? Trying to hold them accountable. And so I do believe in partnering up for accountability. And when uh, Lencioni says peer-to-peer -peer accountability is the primary and most effective source of accountability, that is what I see is really truly embracing it when you're doing peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, you know, we had uh, uh, one of the teams that I was on, uh, we had a very um, dysfunctional leader the boss, he was very dysfunctional. Um, and so what we decided, there was about 13 of us, and I know Lencioni says the smaller the team, the better, there were 13 of us. And so we called ourselves the lucky 13 because boy, were we lucky to have him because in all of his dysfunction, all of us truly learned how not to lead very, very well. So we decided that we were going to work with each other to be accountable to our goals and then also making sure that we held him accountable to what had to be done overall. And so it's kind of like, you know, um, the because we all we're all leaders in our own right. And so we acted as the leaders within our group and then kind of we made him look good in essence. OK. So we actually used a couple of tools to be able to um, embrace accountability peer to peer. And so one of the things that we did was that we would ask the other. So we were paired up 
in groups of three and then um, we would ask each other, one group had four, we would ask each other, well, how do you want to partner up for accountability? Because everybody sees it differently. And one person would say, um, you know, I want you to touch base with me at five o'clock at the end of every day. And these are the three things that I wanna make sure that you help me with making sure it gets done. Another person would say, hey, I look at my emails all the time, send me an email and that's gonna remind me first thing in the morning when I get up to be able to make sure I focus on these items because I have to get these results. Somebody else may be text, somebody else may be a call, somebody could be coffee. So embracing that accountability looks different for so many people. And I do believe that um, with your peers, it could make such a huge difference on the team overall. Does that make sense to, yeah, like to everybody? It. Yeah, yeah. Because I know he, um, once, you know, he talks about, um, you know, kind of like some things that they would do um, on page 61, where he would um, start the exercise having everybody write one thing down. Well, I remember we did that. One of the, um, one of our executives on the team decided that, hey, I want everybody to talk about the one thing. So I was really the rebel in the group. Uh, I was always the rebel of the group because we had done one of those personality tests and everybody was crowded around all the results and all of the, you know, driving results and all that kind of stuff. And I was all the way down, almost out of the box on creativity. <laughs> so as you can well imagine, I was the only one that was all the way, almost out of the box. And our, our boss used to say, don't do anything creative. That's what he would tell me. But I'm wired that way. <laughs> don't do, stay in the box, he would say all the time. And so I had a peer who was very good at diplomacy. And so he's the one I partnered up with. I said, look, help me not to get out of the box. Please help me with accountability to make sure I don't get out of the box. That was a hard task for him, but he, he did it. He really did. But when we were writing down all of these things, that was actually one of the things that my entire team would say, well, Blossom, you're very creative. So I didn't feel like the ogre in the group, right? I didn't feel like the stepchild <laughs> because they actually could appreciate it and be able to say, okay, we know that you can't get out too creative, but we appreciate it about you. So we're going to now embrace that and be able to make sure that we can use the creativity, but within the boundaries, right? So it's, it's a really, really good way to be able to help when your peers are really appreciating who you are, your personality, and then being able to now help you with being accountability and staying in that little box. So um, mm -hmm. I love what he's done here um, in terms of having people kind of write out what they appreciate about each other and mm -hmm. really how can you use it to embrace that accountability piece. So good times, it was good times, good times back then. That's perfect. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I com completely agree. When we understand what we appreciate, and we, like you said, write it down, what you appreciate about people, that's that next level. Yes. You can build with. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Peer to peer accountability. Yeah. Talk about the last section here, which is the easiest one, I think, um, focusing on results. At least for me, it's always been the easiest one. Um, Lencioni talks about it's a big challenge for a lot of companies to focus on results. So, so maybe I'm off base just because of my personal drive, I guess. Um, but ultimately, the whole purpose for building trust, conflict, commitment, and accountability is one thing. Uh, you need results. Uh, businesses without uh, big results, proper results, and, and meeting their goals usually don't make it. So <laughs> this is what it's about. Um, and I talked about it a little bit early. Some of the things that hurt, hurt results is, is um, people get a little too individualistic. Uh, like for, and they focus on their career. They're focused on their personal budget, budgets. Uh, what we found in big companies, uh, status was real important. 
And so that was a hindrance for, for people to, to, to work on results. Sometimes egos, uh, self-interest, um, how am I going to get promoted or loyalty to the people in their organization versus the greater organization. All these things are, are, are possible stumbling blocks, if you will. But, but some of the management tools, and this is where I think it gets simple, is, uh, is, is visual scorecards. Uh, what we used to do, and it was very, very effective, is we would have a, a, um, a, a monthly report out on every, everything that we were supposed to get done, a quarterly report out, and then, and then we'd have a, a yearly goal and a three-year goal. They were always on the wall. They were presented in front of publicly, in front of all the people that were responsible and the senior leaders. Uh, so there was no doubt on where we were going to go and what, what we were expected to do uh, in terms of achieving results. Um, so that was never a difficulty for me in my career is understanding what we need to do and what the goals were. And, and they were communicated well. and Everybody understood them extremely well. Uh, but it was really difficult if you skip step one. Like, like Blossom said, the first chapter in the book wasn't there. <laughs> To have have a, a, a team that, that was based on trust, because then then it just it was so much harder to row the boat uh, to get those results. Um, so so he he coaches a bit on on dashboards and scoreboards and and metrics and goals and and, and making sure everybody understands those. Um, but the but the other side that I'd like to add to that in terms of results is is um, really when you're on a team is is agree to how you're gonna to play together, work together. What are the core values of that team? Uh, because those are the soft sides of a team that, that if we really align on core values um, and, and how, we, how we work together, kind of the guiding principles of, of working together based on the core values. Uh, and then we focus on the results because it's really clear. There's no, there's no confusion about where we're gonna go. Um, I think you'll, you'll achieve some, some big success. With that, that's, uh, I've covered everything that I'd like to cover. We can open for questions or we can, yeah. we can look to the Steve Simpson for a comment. Yeah, I thought I'd jump back in. And uh, so I, I made a little poll here. So I'd like you to participate. Okay. And I asked, um, is it launching? Is it launching? So go there it is okay so i'd invite you to fill out which one of the five um uh, behaviors uh do you find um do you think is most is the biggest challenge for the the team that you're a part of right now basically so uh which one of them would you would you indicate and maybe while people are filling it out steve why don't you uh jump in with some some of your own comments from your your career at procter and gamble yeah, like Ron, um, <clears throat> when you join P&G, you're joining teams. We do everything in a team format. And uh, some years ago in the early 90s, I, I hadn't heard of Lencioni, but I uh, was assigned the task to uh, lead the effort to improve the manufacturing output of the diaper business, Pampers. Now, to understand this is a $9 billion business at the time. And I was expected to get 25% improvement in results in months of time. And I considered it to be possible and everybody else did too. And we underwent a big study to try to understand how can we improve the throughput of manufacturing lines from all over the world by that level, that magnitude. And we studied this enough that we came to a, a, an a amazing conclusion. And that is the, the number one and most significant factor in a getting a 25% improvement was building effective teamwork. And we had a model that we created, which is similar to this. It had five components to it like this, and they're very much overlap. And what we found was by taking this model, we were actually able to build a test and test teams effectiveness against that model. And the test proved to be a, a tool to show a statistical significant correlation 
between the team score, effectiveness score, and their actual results. A good score, good results, bad score, bad results. And it allowed us to focus on what are the trouble areas for a team so that we could be very specific in looking at each team performance to improve it. Now, those components are similar to these. One was the team needed to be very clear on its purpose and be committed to it. So you think about achieving commitment. Well, that's when you fully understand and align on a purpose. And oftentimes the conflict that you have goes right back to, you're not all there for the same reason. You may not agree on what the, the team is supposed to do. So having a clear purpose and align to it was extremely important. Certainly you wanted to have capabilities on the team and you wanted to leverage people's capabilities. That's important. But then this notion of building trust, we needed a culture of trust and some level of compatibility. We found the teams that liked each other and played together and trusted one another were far above those who didn't. Ron mentioned that, you know, the, the person he had conflict with, they ended up playing golf together. Well, I found that the best teams went and went bowling together or they played golf or they had parties or whatever. We found that the relationship building on the team had a significant impact on how well that team operated. When you think about it on a day-to-day -day basis, the issue of holding one another accountable is easier when you have a strong, trusting, caring relationship. So coming out of that study, all the plant managers went back and used this tool that we developed to test these team effectiveness parameters. And what we emphasized was one size doesn't fit all for an improvement solution. You have to look at every team and say, what is missing? If you have a team that doesn't trust each other, you focus on that. If you had a team that they weren't compatible with each other, you focus on that. Or if they didn't understand their goals or they clear, weren't clear on their purpose, you focus on that. And what happened is when they got very specific on the fix for each team, what you needed to do, including moving people around sometimes, that immediately started improving our results. And within six months, we had 25% improvement in our throughput. We didn't change anything in the process. Like Ron says, it wasn't the process, it wasn't the machinery, it wasn't other things. It was how well the teams work together to accomplish their goals. So I'm just kind of summarizing what Ron said in a different context, that the importance of that, that working together was, was extremely uh, beneficial. And Steve, 25% of how many diapers? Oh, we're talking <laughs> millions and millions. <laughs> <laughs> it says that how many yeah this is one of 10 or 12 main diaper plants for png in the world something like that yeah you? we uh well in the u.s we had six diaper plants and and let's put this in perspective these plants ran 24 hours a day seven days a week and they make 600 diapers per minute 10 per second and so you multiply that out you'll get a lot of cases of diapers yeah Great. Well, we had most of the people respond to the poll, so I'll click the end button now and it should show you, yeah, share the results so you can see them. So of the uh, people who um, uh, most people responded, which of the five behaviors do you think your team needs the most? And then number one was building trust, the first one, 44%. Uh, uh, that's uh, seven out of the 16 people who responded. So I, I would like to ask if any of, our, of those of you who are with us now, if anybody who indicated that building trust is um, is a challenge for your team, if any of you would uh, write a question or a comment about that in the chat or, or unmute yourself and you can ask or make a comment in Croatian or in English and we can we can translate this, but you have our, our brain trust of Ron and Steve and Blossom here with us. And so 
um, uh, uh, definitely building trust is a is very foundational for a team. So any of you who um, maybe chose that option, I'd, we'd love to hear maybe a little bit of a little bit of a, a little bit more information or, or story uh, from from one of you. Hi. Hi, uh, Elena. Hi, Nolan. Hi, Hi. Tim. It, uh, I'm so happy to be able to participate today. Uh, and it was such a interesting things to hear. So um, why I choose the trust and uh, for me, the reason is um, I just newly uh, transferred to a company. I'm four months in my role. And um, my, of course, my whole team is new, but also the changes in the team happened. So for me, it's like we are new, we don't know each other, but also we are different nationalities working in very fast paced environment. And um, it's, um, and we depend on each other. And I think sometimes it's hard, you know, to know who you can trust and how vulnerable you can show yourself to some people. And I think that's why the, this building the trust is the first, the most important thing we need to do so that we can bond and that, yes, we can then really start to work together. Because here now, like I'm four months in my role, but I have a colleague that joined the month and I see that she's having like, it's hard for her to ask a question because she's not sure if she can trust that, you know, people will not think that she doesn't know she's not trying or something. And I think that for that everyone to feel open and that, you know, they take risks and that they participate, there needs to be first trust in the team. Uh -huh. Well, Yelna, maybe I could ask you, so, uh, because I think that's, you know, we, we're living in this strange COVID world. So are you physically in the same building with your teammates? Or are you guys mostly working online? And how does that affect trust? Yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's harder. Uh, so for me, it's, uh, let's say, a good thing that now we have opportunity to be physically in the office oh. with many restraints, but some of them work online. And for example, I got a new boss that will be also for a few months out of the country and so wow. everything is online wow and uh it is very challenging mm -hmm. uh because for me personally i when i talk to people i'm um, also tracking a uh, non-verbal cues you know how they are acting and you cannot see it in the camera and sometimes people not even you know turn on the camera so it's so challenging and we have like, I'm Croatian and uh, you know, they are Hungarian or Polish people. And I noticed like a difference in mentality. So it's, you know, for me, like I'm joking and they can take something serious and that makes another barrier. And I think it's so hard to build like um, quality relationships uh, and to show yourself in that way. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anna. That's, that's great. Maybe blossom. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. You, you have cross cult. you, you live in a kind of a culture, <laughs> not, not where you were born and you've been leading, you've been leading and coaching through COVID. Like what are your, what are some of your thoughts about that? Yeah. And actually I'm currently a CEO for a very cross cultural group. I've never really done technology, but it's a small technology group. And so we have, three different cultural mindsets that we're working with. And um, we do something, and I kind of implemented this. We did power Zoom um, coffees. And I would say it's either coffee or tea, right? Or your favorite drink. And so we would have intentional sessions in groups of three. And we did it in threes because of course you always have to have somebody that kind of calls, okay, time out kind of thing, right? But we did these power Zoom coffees. And as you can see from my background, I have a lot of fun online. And we had a, a set group of five questions that had nothing to do with work that we would ask each other. Um, and that's how we would start just to get to know each other, because no matter where you are in the world, to form a connection, um, you really want to make sure you have some kind of a common ground. And, you know, when you when you ask someone a question about, you know, how many, do you have any siblings? Well, most people have siblings. So that's common. 
And then you start feeling an affiliation. And so we have a team in Vietnam, uh, in Vietnam, we have uh, Canada and here. And so the Vietnamese team, we have to meet at 10 o'clock at night, right? Uh, but if we um, do it, not every day, but on a periodic basis, it's 10 o'clock, I'm ready to go to bed. But imagine how they feel knowing that I'm getting on at 10 o'clock to have a power Zoom with them, right? Just to get to know them a little bit better because they're starting their day. That definitely helps someone to start appreciating who you are, right? And then the other thing, uh, Helena ha had said that you're different languages. That's the other thing. I learned um, how to say, like my favorite thing to say every time we meet is, what is the timeline on this, <laughs> right? What is the timeline? I'm always asking about timeline. So I learned to say it in Vietnamese. <laughs> and so now I use that and what that does, it connects to you even further, right? With that person, because they can appreciate the effort that you're taking. So I say, find common ground. Those power Zooms, they really work. They really, really work. And if you can't break bread with them physically in person, this is a good way to have fun with it. That's, I, I really like that. I think that's great to go above and beyond. And I think that to, to me, what I hear is a the difference there is just three people. Um, yeah. you're going to talk if you're just, if it's just three people, you're going to, you're going to exactly. talk. That's, mm -hmm. that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Ron or Steve, uh, uh, you guys, any thoughts on that as well? I think what Blossom also emphasized is sharing things about yourself that are personal, doing the kind of team building that tells people who you are outside of work. Things like, you know, what's your name mean? And how did your parents come up with your name? You know, and do you have siblings? Um, to, to, what are your hobbies? And things that, things that will connect, that humanize people. Because the one thing that Zoom does in a sense is it dehumanizes us. The, the thing I miss about not coming to Croatia are the conversations that happen in between teaching sessions. Yeah. Just chatting with people. Who are you? What do you do? And tell me about your family. And what happens in Zoom is you're stuck with this medium where you see everybody or you don't see them. You, you see names and we don't have a connectability and only one person is talking at a time. So there's no ability to have side conversations where people are connecting with the person sitting next to them. So you miss that. So you have to design it in, like Blossom says, in order to get that intimacy and that personal touch. So Steve, I'm gonna give you guys a real funny story. Um, um, I used to do fuzzy slipper day in my office, right? And it was a talking conversation. Now, who did I get that idea from? My kids. Mm -hmm. Mom, y'all are so serious all the time. Why don't you wear fuzzy slippers? So on Zoom, one day we were having this meeting with a group of women leaders and the um, hostess said, um, well, you know, this is so easy for me. I just ran in here and, you know, I took care of dinner. And then she held her foot up and she says, oh, I have my, I have my, fuzzy, I have my fuzzy socks on, right? And before you know it, several people put up their, so their feet and said, yeah. I have my fuzzy socks, so you know what I do now to get to know people a little bit better and to break the ice on Zoom? All right, we're gonna wear fuzzy socks. So let's talk about those fuzzy socks today. And I have the team, their team, wherever they are, we talk about fuzzy socks just to break the ice and to, you know, just to get to know each other a little bit better, so. That's, that's great. Uh... Yeah, building trust on teams is 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 interesting. I I listened, I think, uh, um, to a Lencioni podcast maybe where he mentioned how he really that's a big part of his work is to try to get teams to start sharing with each other, tell a story. He asked, like I think Ron mentioned that the story, you know, asking people to share about a a challenge you overcame as a child. You have to that's vulnerable, and you have to work to build the trust to maybe even feel like you could do that in a team. 
but he is a as a consultant to very very large corporations says that sometimes that's one of the most crucial steps towards actually getting unstuck is just the is that people know oh that guy who's you know seems so difficult all the time i had no idea that what he went through growing up or whatever and that starts to unlock a different way of relating ron i lost thoughts of like uh yeah you want to throw in there before we talk about mastering conflicts and we see if we can get let's go i think we did pretty well i mean that the zoom thing is is just a challenge but i i love these ideas that we we talked about I mean, having lived in a, in a foreign country in a far Western piece of it and not being able to see my, a lot of my colleagues and, and I lived on Zoom far before Zoom existed. I mean, it was uh, something else then, right? Um, we always, as a leadership team, came together quarterly so we could be in the room together, <laughs> even though we were all going to fly to Thailand or something to do that. But we recognized the importance of, of getting in a room together. But apparently, you know, during COVID or whatever, it's it's just more challenging. It's good. Right. Right. Well, the second then uh, result, 25% of the uh, folks indicated that mastering conflict was maybe most uh, um, uh, the biggest need on their team. So I would like ask if there'd be another person to be willing to volunteer. Again, you can say it in Croatian or in English, or you can type. Is somebody who sees mastering conflict as as a as a big challenge, um, maybe would be willing to give us, like Yelena did, a little bit of a, a little bit of a um, taste for uh, how you are facing that right now. Okay, well, I also can open open up now, like anybody who uh, you have another, another um, any kind of question or uh, comment maybe on uh, anything having to do this evening. Now, now's the time to uh, let us know. And, um, you know, that you have your, you have your tribunal of our guests. Uh, you can uh, share with them a, a business challenge or a, a team challenge you're facing right now. Maybe as people are thinking, I'll 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 say I um, uh, how to put this. Uh, you know, uh, I, I'm you know my friends here know I, I'm an American. I've been living in Croatia for 20 years. My my wife is Croatia Croatian, and um, uh, we have two sons who are in schools here. Um, Croatia is a fairly warm culture. Uh, it's a it's a culture in which um, people can be be pretty direct. Uh, and uh, um, at least I found coming from where I was coming from, uh, from California, that in Croatia, things can be pretty, um, uh, people can tell you very bluntly and very directly, a lot of times um, what they, how they feel and what they think needs to happen. Um, so uh, I would guess that oftentimes in Croatia, the problem isn't the avoidance of conflict, it's kind of how to master it. It's like the conflict's going to be there. And it's a question of how to how to do it, how to do it well. So uh, Ron, maybe I, I know, like you've told me some stories and, you know, at times, like you worked in the auto industry, a lot of conflict can, you know, labor versus management. I mean, there's movies made about, you know, some of that kind of stuff. So what are some things that you try and keep in mind in a very hot emotional conflict uh, kind of environment? Yeah, for, for, for me, and, and yeah, and I've been in a lot of emotional meetings or conversations or maybe blow ups because people tend to, in the West, um, get excited, I might be the word. <laughs> uh, I learned something from a fellow years ago, um, and, and, in, and in terms of emotional intelligence, is think about winning and losing, and since I'm a high D, if you know what that means, um, I'm very driven to succeed and the score of winning is, is very important to me. Um, I consider it a loss, a personal loss if someone hi emotionally hijacks me. 
if someone says something that makes me lose my cool or my temper, I've been emotionally hijacked and it's like losing a, a score in a football game. I can't let that happen. And so I think of it that way. And so when I see someone I know that's out of control and might even say something insulting or personal, I quickly went to, to I'm gonna win this. I'm gonna win it because I'm gonna be the calm person in the room. I'm gonna focus on the bigger picture. My, my new challenge now that I've given myself is how do I bring this situation from this high level of energy to something we can work with, to a tension level we can have a rational conversation. And so then I'll use a lot of the skills um, that I've learned uh, in terms of body gestures, sit back, hands behind the head, um, a calm response to an excited person, like asking a question, oh man, I, I think I understand what you're talking about. That sounds terrible. I can't, this is awful. Affirm that it, it's a big problem. This is really awful. Oh, can you, can you give me a little more context? Because I can understand it. Because we we got <clears throat> we got to make this a priority, and I want I want to get into this right now. So so I just validated their feelings because I said, hey, look, this this is big, it's important. I want to know more. Get them to talk. And so I, I want to bring that level down to something we can work with. And um, it's it's really just. It, and unfortunately for me, I've been raised in the auto industry with. So I hate this the United Auto Workers. That's something I had to learn early on to, to, to deal with people that, that, that maybe don't need to control their emotions. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, but, but in order to have a conversation, you've got to get it to a level you can work with. And there's, there's tools that you could use. Blossom, what is 30 seconds of misery with a BMW? So it's, it's so simple and probably uh, laughable, but uh, I really ask the, the leaders of my teams to do this respectfully, right? And very intentionally. Um, basically, each person has 30 seconds every time they huddle to just vent out whatever it is that's been bothering them on the prior conversation. 30 seconds. Then people will weigh in. So you spend about a minute total. Then once that's out there, it's embraced, then like a BMW, we're gonna park it in the parking lot because we may not be able to deal with it today, but we're gonna park it so we can move forward with the rest of the conversation. Wow. Yeah. Cool. That's really interesting. Thank you. Uh, I won't call anybody out, but I know we actually have some pretty high level creation leaders on this call. So um, uh, I'd love to hear anybody's, um, you know, kind of uh, uh, insights or their own, your, your um, uh, uh, kind of comparison maybe on, on, a, on any, of the, any of the topics that we've touched on so far this evening. For many of you. Yeah, we'd, well, we'd love to hear another person. Yelena, that was great the way you shared with us. We have a um, and a couple more minutes. I mean, we have kind of time for one one good last uh, take at this. Uh, I will share the follow up information kind of at the end here. But uh, please, if any of you have a a thought or feedback, um, uh, it'd be great to, to hear you hear you guys. And you can do it in Croatian. I can translate for you if you need that. Lena says, thanks, Paula, <laughs> grazie, hey, multiple languages. Um, uh, Steve, how did conflict work in, do you, how, uh, there are legends about how you do and do not do conflict with Japanese colleagues. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you want to share a quick story? Um, the cultural differences between Americans and Japanese is so huge that, um, it really did um, change the way 
you treated everything. So what we found, for example, that in a room of people, in a team of people in Japan, uh, it's very much driven by honor and shame. And, and typically what will happen is you will realize that the oldest person in the room is the one that's determining what's going on. Uh, they're very age oriented. So I recall a time where we were having a difficulty with a machine and I had an engineer redesigning the machine and the Japanese team also had an engineer designing, redesigning it. And we came together to try to pick the best improvement and we couldn't come to agreement. It just, no matter what, we could not agree. And of course, in the Japanese culture, consensus is everything. Uh, they, they have to all agree and we weren't. And then I realized, oh, the reason we're not is because the oldest person in the room was the one behind the Japanese design and nobody was going to criticize that because it's driven by a cultural honor. And so the way you work that is you stop the meeting and then you do something they call nimawashi, which is massaging, which is go to each person and talk to them and have an individual conversation until everybody, including the man who designed it, can feel like we can move forward with something other than his design without being shamed. And then you come back together and the decision goes like that. So they, the, the Japanese have this expression that Americans have a fast gun and a, <coughs> and a slow bullet. Hmm. But the Japanese have a slow gun and a fast bullet. It takes a long time to make a decision, but once they make it, it goes. And learning that cross-cultural difference was huge because we were stuck all the time with our different operating styles based on culture. That's, that is really fascinating. I think that's a great uh, reminder that, you know, we probably in a book like this, there'll be kind of a, in general, an international business, I think there's this push towards directness and um, frankness and being, you know, driving conflict out in the open so you can resolve it. And, uh, and yet that's not how all cultures in the world do things by any means. And so uh, you really want to get to the goal. You want to get to a team that works well together effectively. And that can mean, yeah, just, uh, you know, going, going and doing some things you, you know, that, that are unexpected, like, like just the, the pause that it takes and to allow some consensus to build and then, and then things happen. And, in, in ways that I've heard that many times that uh, there are indirect cultures um, do things that seem to take a long time to people from direct cultures, but then once they get um, consensus, it really sticks and things just go. So that's a great example. Well, we're, we're close to the end of our time. So let me share my screen again. And I will, so that um, we talk just a little bit about uh, what could be a, um, a next step. So uh, one of the things that GLP loves to offer, and one of the reasons I love working with these guys, is that when they when they do a seminar, they also offer even more of themselves uh, uh, for other people to engage with. So um, they uh, there are some mentoring session slots available that are on offer with Blossom, Ron, and Steve over the next few days. The purpose is to help you. Uh, the target is for there to be three people, not not um, the th three people being basically Ron, Steve, or Blossom, plus me if I'm available, plus you. So that if language is a challenge or any concepts that are, are tricky, I'll be able to uh, jump in uh, and help, or, or maybe one of my colleagues. Um, but uh, there might be a few slots where um, where it would be just the, the two of you as well. And we do it over Zoom, and the it's a 75-minute slot. So um, I am going to now put into the, oh, every time I share, that's one of the things about Zoom, every time you share, everything moves around on the screen. Sorry, just one second. Um, where, uh, where to go? Okay, I'll do this. Um, here is the, so I, I, in the chat, I just put a Google form. So if this is interesting to you, please click on the link to go to the Google form. 
uh, and to check the boxes of the times that could work for you. The times are in Zagreb time, so local creation time that work for these guys who are six or seven hours uh, behind us in the United States. Um, so again, the, the link is in the chat. It's uh, HTTPS forms dot GLE, blah, 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 blah. So if you are interested in a chance to uh, spend a Zoom session with one of the three of our speakers um, over the next few days, please, please go there and fill that out. The last thing I will do is go back to my sharing so that I can show you this, which is the um, how to find our folks uh, online. Um, we were we 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 didn't um, update everything enough. Uh, Blossom, sorry, are you are you on LinkedIn and Facebook, Blossom? How would you like people to try to follow your work? Yeah, it's it could be um, on LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Okay. So, so I'll, yeah, I'll drop it in the chat if you want. Great. Great. And so we have the, the emails there uh, for the folks, the, the website for their um, for their organization, globalissuepartners.org, um, and their names. They're, they're easy guys to find. And I mean, uh, they really are amazing people. I, I uh, have had an amazing experience uh, with everybody on this, um, with Blossom and I met for the first time here, but with Steve and Ron, mm -hmm. a really wonderful time. Um, and they they have been incredibly gracious to to folks that have reached out to them and have been interested in spending time together. So, um, yeah. So that again, that is that's uh, that is what we have for this evening. And uh, I want to honor your time. We thank you for for joining us and being a part of it. Yeah, Blossom just put her LinkedIn um, direct link uh, there in and uh we really appreciate you being with us on this still still rainy late fall evening here here in zagreb um uh, so i hope this was a little bit of a, a brightness in the midst of a of a rainy rainy afternoon here for all of you uh but thank you very much for being with us uh it is very nice that uh we were able to be with our friends again from Golusha partners and again please uh click on the link and uh enter the the the, the times that work for you um and uh we can we can uh, go ahead and uh, formally end our time but uh stick around for a couple minutes if there's somebody who did want to ask something and maybe just kind of was a little bit slow to kind of think about what they wanted to do um I'll be here for another couple and we'll be here for another couple of minutes. But again, thank you so much for being with us. And uh, please, um, uh, uh, oh, the, we will also put the, we will put the, the recording for this online and everyone who registered will get a link to the recording. So thank you all for being with us.